Well, if it isn't the end of January, finally. Hi friends, my name is Hannah and welcome to my January wrap up. I love January wrap ups because I feel like we split into two camps. There's the people whose goals remain intact and are full of optimism and there's the people who that's not the case for. Either way, it's absolutely fine. I am pleased to say that I'm part of the former group. I I feel like I have, at their core, retained the integrity of my 2024 reading goals. I feel like I've had a really positive month. I feel like some of the things that I wanted from my reading this year, I have found space for in January, despite it being 842 days long. So I read 12 books in January, I read 10 novels, one book of poetry and one non-fiction book. Of those, one was a library book, one was an ebook, four were audiobooks, which means that about 50% of my reading was actual physical books from my TBR. Oh my god, half my reading. Some people will think that that is not a very good statistic. I personally am thrilled by 50% of my reading being stuff I already own. I thought, um, just because I've, I've slightly changed the way that I track my reading on um, the spreadsheet that I use this year, uh, I thought it might be interesting to see month to month what my average reading year is. So like doing an average of the publication years of every book um, that I read that month. I'm just, I'm just interested, I'm curious. And it was 2009 this month, but very, very heavily skewed by one book that was published in the 1920s, which I think pulled everything back. So um, if you've seen my goals video of the year or indeed the, the last vlog that I put up on my channel, um, you will know that one of the words that I have branded 2024 with is impatient. I wanted to be a more impatient reader this year. I wanted to stop deferring and putting off books that I thought I was going to really enjoy for some imaginary circumstance in the future and just go I want to read that book now. So um, the first four books I'm going to talk to you about are books that were in that vlog that I put up on my channel last week because I sat down on the 1st of January which was actually before I had officially planned my goals for the year and I just looked at my bookcase, this, this bookcase here behind me, and went, what do I feel like reading? And I picked four books off the shelf and I read them. And these were them. So I'm not gonna talk about these in any great amount of detail because there's like a, a vlog where I talk about them at length. So <laughs> we're, I'm gonna try and keep this relatively brief. So the first book that I read was Open Water by Caleb Azuma Nelson. Uh, this is his debut book, it's the first book by him that I have read and I loved this book. Um, it's sort of partly this really sensitive, lovely um, romance story between two young black people in London and then it's partly this dissection of black masculinity and identity in modern culture and then it is also part like ode to black art and creativity. Basically it's it's really good. Um, the narrative style it's written in the second person um, and it took me a minute to get into it but once I was in I was in. Um, it's got like some stunningly beautiful prose in it, really complexly explored and nuanced ideas for such a, a small book um, and very, very measured and assured for a debut novel. And um, yeah, I think it achieved absolutely what it set out to do. And I thoroughly, thoroughly recommend it. Um, the second book I read was another disgustingly good debut novel by a British novelist. Um, this is Maps of Our Spectacular Bodies by Maddie Mortimer. You can tell because this book came out, I think, did it come out in 2021? Okay, 2022. I hate hardbacks and I bought this book in hardback because I was so desperate to read it and I just, 
I could have got it in paperback. I could have got it in paperback. Never mind, never mind. I've read it now and I'm so glad that I did. So this is probably the hardest book to describe succinctly, but I will give it a go. It is essentially the story of um, a woman called Leah who uh, is a mother and she is diagnosed with cancer for the second time in her life. So she's had cancer previously and she's been in remission for a while and the cancer comes back and it is half the book. It's told in these like really quite short vignettes um, and half of those roughly are from the real world perspective of, of Leah's life. Some reflecting on her past, some moments in the present, often following Leah, but sometimes following other other characters um, like her husband and her daughter. And then the other vignettes are told from this sort of like body space that is narrated by the cancer in her body. And I know that that, that, that sounds weird and like it shouldn't work, but oh my God, it really does. It really, it really does work. And while it is very clever and quite avant-garde and quite cerebral, it's also got this like absolute beating human heart at the center of it. And I just, I thought it was a really, really interesting, playful, even though it's dealing with such heavy subject matter. Um, and there are most, like moments in this book where you feel the full weight of that. Um, but it's also kind of joyful in parts and the experience of reading it is quite, it feels quite playful. Um, and yeah, I just, I thought the explorations in here of trauma and grief and our relationship with our bodies of parenthood and motherhood specifically, um, just so much to to admire i could talk about this book ad nauseum it's it's not a perfect book in my opinion um i do think you can tell it's a a debut but i oh my god there is so much to admire in this so there's that then the third book that i read in that vlog was death in her hands by atessa moshbeg this is the second atessa moshbeg uh that i have read and this is not so much a who done it as a like if done it um, so it opens with our protagonist, Vesta, walking in the woods with her dog in the morning and she finds a note that reads, her name was Magda, nobody will never know who killed her, it wasn't me, here is her dead body. Except there's no dead body there. And so you might be forgiven for thinking, well, that's a weird practical joke, but not our Vesta. She briefly considers that this might not be a real thing um, and then becomes incredibly, excuse me while I just stretch out my leg, um, she becomes incredibly invested in finding out who Magda was and what happened to her, despite there being no proof except for this one note that there ever was anyone called Magda and that she was ever in any danger. And, and you see Vesta playing these like long drawn out imaginary games with herself um, about who these people could be. And she fabricates this whole narrative um, about who Magda was, who might have killed her, who the person who left the note was. And um, we see her doing this, but at points she, it's like she forgets that she's done it. So Vesta is, um, is an elderly woman. Uh, her husband has sort of semi-recently passed away and she's relocated to this tiny little cabin in this really small quite remote town in the states and so she everything about her character is set up to make you think she's losing it a little bit and there are moments in the book where she's she's clearly processing a lot of her past she's becoming increasingly obsessed by this mystery and her paranoia is mounting and mounting so at first we're like oh my god this is so sad and then things start to happen that make you think well hang on i was pretty confident that this was all in her head but is this all in her head and that's all i'm gonna say for now i didn't 
enjoy the reading experience of this as much as the other two books. Um, there is a lot in here that I really appreciate and found really interesting, but I didn't necessarily find myself like completely drawn in. And it's definitely not a book to pick up if you uh, appreciate, want, or indeed need a clear resolution or ending. There is something that happens in this book that makes me incredibly angry and sad but I'm very glad I read it. And I feel a little similarly about this book. So this is the last book that I read in that vlog and it is Scary Monsters by Michelle de Kretzer, which is a book that was in danger. I picked it up with a little bit of trepidation because I thought it might be a little bit gimmicky. So it is a reversible book. There are two stories in here that meet in the middle of, of the book and you can read them in either order. So I started with Lily, with the green half, which is um, told, it's set in the 70s in France, and Lily is a uh, woman in her 20-somethings. Her family were originally from an unspecified Asian country who then emigrated to Australia when she was a teenager, and then Lily has subsequently moved to France where she's teaching English. Then there is Lyle, who is living in a near future Australia. Him and his wife are also migrants from an unspecified Asian country. And so the, the books, the, the halves of the book are in conversation with each other. They are linked by an incredibly tenuous, like narrative story beat. And other than that, they are quite separate but the themes that they're tackling are really similar. So both books are very concerned with these scary monsters, which uh, in the book manifest as, to name but a few, racism, xenophobia, anti-migrant uh, sentiment, climate breakdown, violence against women, misogyny, patriarchy, uh, authoritarianism. So there's lots of kind of political themes that are being explored through these sort of quite ordinary seeming um, experiences of two people who happen to be migrants. There was so much in, in this book that made me really think and there were parts of the writing that were stunningly beautiful. I think Michelle de Kretzer is a, is a beautiful writer. It's almost the, the part of the, the thing I found dissatisfying about it, if that's even the right word, was that it was almost like dissatisfying by design because the nature of how the book is structured, where the stories come together in the center of the book, there's a real kind of like, it almost just stops. It's a bit like with Death in Her Hands, it doesn't come to a conclusion. It leaves it very open. It's very much thrown wide to uh, the reader to draw their own conclusions and make their own assumptions about what happened. But I think also that was my experience reading Lily and then Lyle, but then I think it might feel different if you read Lyle and then Lily. I don't really know. Lots, lots to admire, as I said, even if a bit like Death in Her Hands, I wasn't always like drawn to to picking the book up, although I always enjoyed it when I did. So those were those were the four, um, and I really enjoyed that little experiment. And I've actually decided um, that as long as I continue enjoying the experiment, I'm going to continue it. So I've I've started another vlog um, on the first of February, doing exactly the same thing, picking up some books off my shelf that I'm just excited to read that month that are not linked in any other way except for the fact that I want to read them. So that's been really nice. So I'm, I'm gonna stick with my, uh, my theme of impatience. And one thing I really wanted to do last year, really, um, and didn't do, was read my first Persephone book. Um, so Persephone, if you're not familiar with them, are um, a UK-based publisher who publish um, old or forgotten classics, not exclusively, but often written by women. Um, and I bought this in, I think, December 2022. And I only, this was the, technically the first book that I read in January. I So I was reading it over the Christmas and New Year period and I finished it on New Year's Day. So forgive me if I'm a little um, 
rusty because Hannah lost the plot. But this is the book that was set in the 1920s that I, I mentioned earlier about pulling my uh, pulling my average back to 2009. And um, The Call follows a young woman called Ursula Winfield and it the narrative tracks her sort of slow and somewhat reluctant awakening to the cause of women's suffrage. Um, Ursula is quite an eccentric character. It opens and she's doing these, um, she has a chemistry uh, laboratory that she set up in her, in like a spare room in her house. Her family are quite wealthy, which is fortunate. Um, and she's like quite a brilliant chemist. She comes up against a lack of equality quite regularly, but weirdly is quite resistant to the idea of, of suffrage, not in that she didn't, she doesn't think women should have the vote, but that she doesn't agree with the tactics being used by the suffragettes and um, sort of doesn't think there's anything to be gained by acting all like loud and brash and hysterical. And slowly circumstances um, align and, and she begins to change her mind and that's that's not a, a spoiler, it's, it's literally what the whole book is about. Um, and you'd be forgiven for thinking based on that description that I, I just gave that this might be quite a lectury, preachy kind of moralistic book given that the author has a quite clear political perspective that she's uh, talking about in the book. Oh, this is by Edith Ayrton Zangwill, by the way. Did I say that? Because you definitely won't be able to see from the cover. But I actually felt that, that this felt incredibly character driven and human and was explored in a really um, holistic way. Ursula is really complex and you, you don't always agree with her and even though you can see from quite early on the direction of travel that she is likely to move in that doesn't take away from the narrative enjoyment for me because it's almost watching this thing unfold in front of you is is part of the enjoyment and I thought it was really well written I mean it's quite it's reasonably chunky it's over 400 pages and um it felt like quite a uh, fast paced, um, quite a like entertaining read, which I think a lot of people don't think of books from this era as being, but that was definitely my experience of it. There was some unfortunate use of disability um, at the end of the novel, which I didn't love. I am sort of willing to overlook it given um, that this is, is a book that was written um in the 20s but i'm just i'm just flagging it if that might be something that would put you off or even just to be aware of if you do decide to pick it up it also doesn't um really explore ursula's class privilege as much as we might want to see as a modern audience regarding kind of women's suffrage but then neither did saltburn and that came out this year so you know um, i will definitely though be, be picking up more persephone books I, I really really enjoyed this one. And another book that I'd been meaning to to get to for a while and hadn't was Poor Things by Alistair Gray. So again if you've been on my channel um, recently you will probably know that um, I've been doing, uh, I've just started doing, often with my friend Farmer, a series of book to screen adaptation videos. So I read this um, in a book to screen video that I did. So I read the novel and then watched the film adaptation uh, of Poor Things. And that is up on, on my channel if you wanna go and see the um, in-depth conversation that, that we had about the uh, film. But the TLDR is, uh, I loved this book and I didn't love the film, although there were parts of it that, that I liked and admired. And I would actually, uncommonly, if you are interested in both reading and watching this book slash film, I would actually recommend that you watch the film first and then read the book. So this is a book that's kind of like His Bloody Project by Graham McRae Burnett meets Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Um, set in Victorian Glasgow. The largest part of this book um, is formed of these recollections of a man called Archie McCandless 
who is a um, medical officer living in Glasgow, recounting the uh, narrative of how he met his wife, uh, who now goes by Victoria McCandless, but um, who used to go by Bella Baxter. And according to him, Bella was the literal brainchild of a, a friend and colleague of his called Godwin Baxter. So he alleges that Godwin Baxter saved a woman's life who had tried to kill herself by replacing her brain with the brain of her unborn child because she was pregnant when she died um, and reanimating her. So Bella Baxter, according to her own husband, um, at the point when he met her, had the brain of a toddler in the body of a fully grown woman. And so a big chunk of the narrative is is that. It's it's that story and the various adventures that happen. And the narrative is, is very odd, quite fantastical, but extremely subjective because wrapped around that narrative, we hear from Bella herself, who has written accompanying documentation, <laughs> uh, completely refuting her husband's version of events. She's a bit embarrassed for him and basically goes through and goes, that's not what happened. This is what happened. And so you've got two conflicting versions of events there. And then Alistair Gray does something that I love when, when an author does this and they pull it off well, it's like catnip to me. He inserts himself as a character into a third framing narrative that is the author Alistair Gray discovering, editing and publishing these documents. So he's presenting the whole book as a series of found documents um, but he himself also has a very clear perspective on what did or didn't happen. And the whole thing is this really layered exploration of um, subjectivity, how you tell the story of a person's life, who gets to tell the story of a person's life. But within it, there's this like utterly bonkers, fantastical, sci-fi, fantasy, weird narrative. I like... There was so much to admire and I, I really, really, really loved this book. And even more impatiently, I uh, read a proof on NetGalley of interesting facts about space by Emily Austin. So I was particularly interested to read this because uh, her book, Everyone in This Room Will Someday Be Dead, was one of my favourite books of 2022. Um, and it was the tone of that book that I enjoyed so much. Uh, it was very funny and irreverent and queer. And I was really pleased that the tone of this book was also funny, irreverent and queer. Um, and this follows a young woman called Enid who is going through a bit of a time. Uh, her dad has sort of semi-recently passed away. He walked out on her family, her and her mum when she was very, very small and she's recently kind of started having a relationship with her half-sisters, but it's all a bit awkward and fraught. Um, she has this increasingly potent fear of bald men going on that we don't quite understand at first. And the first chapter of the book, she is confronted by the wife of the woman that she's currently sleeping with. Uh, she compulsively watches these um, old YouTube videos of herself that she did when she was like a teenager in this kind of emotionally masochistic way. Um, and there's like a lot going on and it is like a bit of an intentional and incredibly amusing hot mess. Um, it sounds a bit like I'm being flippant about it, but I, I genuinely really enjoyed it. I think it's really, really hard to capture emotional truth while also making people laugh. And for me, and for my personal <laughs> sense of humor, I think Emily Austin really toes that line really brilliantly. There is so much in this book that is about um, the difficulty of our relationship with our parents, about repressed trauma, about fear, about shame, about self-esteem, about rejection. And she explores all of those things while still making you laugh, but not in this like very try hard way. I didn't really enjoy um, Really Good Actually by Monica Hasey for 
for that reason, I felt always like she was throwing in jokes to try and make me laugh and that they weren't serving the emotional truth for me. And he, I mean, books are subjective at the best of time, but when we start talking about humor and what's funny and what makes people laugh, it's like even more subjective. Um, but for me, Emily Austin's writing style felt a lot more natural and fluid to me and, and a bit more um, funny. And on top of that, I genuinely did learn some interesting facts about space. Um, please don't judge this book by this cover. I, I, I don't, I hate this cover. I don't, I don't know why it's got this cover. And I would, if I hadn't already read an Emily Austin book, I never would have picked it up with this cover. So if you are looking at this and going, mm, just this cover does it no justice. I'm mad at it. Um, but yeah, very, very good. So I read it as a proof, but it is already out now by the time you will be watching this video. So you can go and check it out. I also said I wanted to be, in 2024, more intentional about my reading and to kind of start looking in a few different places for different things to read, reading a little more out of my comfort zone. And one of the things I wanted to do was dip my toe a little bit more into reading poetry. In the past, I have read, I've read Jen Campbell's poetry before because I am a fan of her YouTube content um but other than that I haven't read a lot of like contemporary poetry but I had previously read a few individual poems by Wendy Cope and liked them so I picked up family values from my local library because I feel like my library is going to come in extra handy when I'm trying to figure out what kind of poetry I like because it's just it's so low risk and actually the libraries near me have really good broad ranges of poetry so yeah this is family values by wendy cope and sadly i didn't really like this collection um i absolutely adore her poem the orange which i know is kind of basic as me because most people if they like wendy cope like the orange and yes i may or may not be planning an orange tattoo but i was pretty underwhelmed by this collection as a whole there wasn't really um any poems in here that particularly grabbed me. I quite liked the first one. That was definitely my favourite of the collection and I always think it's a bit sad and disappointing when the first one you read is your favourite one because it kind of goes, oh, you get all excited and then nothing quite lives up to it. But the first poem in here is a really miserable one about Christmas, which I, I did enjoy called, what's it called? Um, a Christmas Song. But even though I didn't really particularly enjoy this. I mean, it's only a tiny poetry. It doesn't take you long to read. So it's not like I'd committed hours and hours of my life to this thing that I didn't particularly like. But it, I'm glad I read it. And this is going to sound like a backhanded compliment. And I, you're just going to have to believe me when I, I don't mean it to sound the way it's going to sound. But she's a really accessible poet. You don't have to work too hard to decode what is going on in these poems. It's very readable it's very relatable so I, I I am glad I read it because I think it was a good collection for me to dip my toe into and get a little more confident as a poetry reader I mean I haven't done serious poetry reading since my undergraduate degree which was <clears throat> over a decade ago so you'll be seeing more poetry from me possibly not from from Wendy Cope but I have um got a few more things out of the library that I'm already enjoying much more so my poetry game is is looking up but you'll have to uh, wait for February's wrap up to hear about those and that brings us to the audiobook portion of this video so the four audiobooks that I read this month one of them was a reread um at Christmas time I normally, it has recently become a tradition that I re-listen to His Dark Materials and the first two books of um, The Book of Dust by Philip Pullman and I rolled The Secret and Commonwealth over into January. I finished it a, a few days into January so I did finish reading The Secret Commonwealth by Philip Pullman. Um, this is a book that has massively grown on me. I remember being actively angry when I first read this book because I 
I was so sad about Pan and Lyra's relationship in this book. So this one, if you're not familiar with the Book of Dust, um, there's two volumes have come out so far. When is volume three coming? Um, and the first one is like a prequel to His Dark Materials. And then this one is a sequel to it um, about 10 years later, I think. And uh, Lyra's at, at university. But yeah, I I enjoy it m more every time I read it. I think this is maybe my fourth or fifth time reading The Secret Commonwealth. Um, but I am still not, I'm still not on board with the burgeoning relationship between Lyra and Mal. I really like Lyra. I really like Mal, but it still gives me the ick. It still gives me the ick. I'm not bashing an, an age gap relationship. I'm really not, but um, he knew her as a baby, which I just can't get past. I just can't get past. I, I have faith that Philip will be able to stick this landing in book three, which allegedly was supposed to be coming out in 2024, but I have heard absolutely nothing about it. So God knows when it's gonna be coming out. But if you work in publishing and you have like Intel, please, please let me know because I, I desperately need a conclusion. But yeah, I love Philip Pullman's writing. Um, the audiobook is narrated by Michael Sheen. So like, no complaints here. Another book that I read and enjoyed this month was the only nonfiction book that I read this month, which was The Hidden Case of You and Four Bees by Zoe Playden, uh, which was read by Rebecca Root. Um, this was absolutely fascinating and was a thing that I knew nothing about. But if you are, if you like nonfiction, that's kind of in the legal intrigue, space and or you're into queer and specifically trans history fully recommend this book i'm going to give you a potted history of, of what the book covers but essentially it came about and forgive me if i get some details wrong here because you know i will be living up to my name zoe first heard about this case because some friends of hers or colleagues of hers who were working on a um trans rights case a uh, legal case were basically taken aside by the judge in like, what they called like in chambers or something and told, oh, by the way, there's this case that sets legal precedent here that you're not allowed to reference or know about, but I have to tell you about, but you're not allowed to know about it. And that's basically all they said. They just said there's a case that sets legal precedent for the thing that we're looking at here and then told them that they weren't allowed to reference it. Suspicious. Um, and Zoe went away and they tried to research the case. They, they worked and worked and worked and, and eventually they found the case of, of Ewan Forbes, who was a trans man, or we understand him today to be a, a, a trans man, whose case was tried in the UK in the 60s and has all of these potential repercussions for um, trans rights today. But his case, but basically when they were trying to find out about this case, they couldn't find the documentation anywhere. Now, any UK citizen is supposed to be able to access like legal decisions that have been made are all supposed to be public knowledge. Um, and no one could find Ewan's case anywhere. Um, and eventually it came to light, someone had said it had been misplaced. Um, and Ewan was um, assigned female at birth. Uh, he was a Scottish baronet. And basically his, his life was going fine. He, he socially transitioned, he was, um, at the time diagnosed with what we would now define as being intersex. Um, but there's kind of a lot of nuance that the book goes into. Um, but essentially, whether he was intersex or whether he was um, just a trans man, uh, 
is sort of by the by because what ended up happened the case that has been hidden from you the year and i'm sorry i'm talking so much about this, this is very complex um, but the case was brought to court because um ewan was in line to inherit uh the baronetcy in his family so he was like a scottish baronet um and it was one of those awful patriarchal inheritances that can only be inherited by a man and so this other distant relative tried to sue Ewan out of his birthright by saying that he wasn't really a man because he was assigned female at birth and the reason Ewan's case is a bit of a landslide case or, or should have been a, not a landslide landmark case or should be if it were more widely known is that he won his case because the doctors, the, the medical professionals basically said gender is more expansive and includes more things than just the physical bits between your legs. And that set the legal precedent. It's, it is our legal precedent and it's been squashed. So it's a fascinating book. I, I thought it went, um, so the book tells the whole history of Ewan's life and it's been so meticulously and thoroughly researched and the court case and the implications of what that could and should mean for trans rights beyond just this case. It was so, so interesting. For me, I was a bit overwhelmed by how much information was in this book. So I'm like, I'm really glad it exists, but it is encyclopedic with what it is including. And at points I got a bit like, oh, whoa, that is a lot of information for me to keep inside my very, very civvy brain. But um, yeah, I thought, I thought it was so, so interesting. What I will say, I love Rebecca Root. I think it was absolutely right and correct that they got a trans actor to narrate this book. However, she cannot do a Scottish accent and she does try quite a lot. So if that is likely to annoy you, maybe don't get the audiobook. But I, I, I do recommend it, particularly, as I said, if you, if you are interested in legal and or the history of, of queer and trans rights. I think it's a really interesting book. And then last but not least, no, penultimately, <laughs> um, I listened to This Green and Pleasant Land by Aisha Malik, which was narrated by Rita Sharma. This is a book that follows Bilal, who is living in a very quintessential English country village. And on his mother's deathbed, she makes him promise, or she asks on her deathbed, that he build a mosque in his village in her honour. And um, that is what this, what this book is about. It is about Bilal trying to come to terms with how he could possibly do this, given um, the reality of the community that he lives in and who would or wouldn't be receptive to a mosque being built in their community. And on the whole, I found this book like enjoyable, interesting. The writing style was really engaging. There's this like really varied, vibrant cast of characters. I thought all the issues surrounding um, identity and legacy and, and place and belonging, um, that sort of tension between um, conserving traditions, but also blending communities and being open um, was all really interesting although I did find some sorry I kicked you there um I found some of the characters a little bit tropey like almost bordering on the like panto-esque although that I might have been um I might have been colored by uh listening to it on on audiobook possibly but yeah I, th I thought some of the characterization um, was a little bit heavy handed, um, but still like, like I said, still an engaging story. Um, and I think the reason I, 
I didn't quite love it is because um, alongside this sort of like story of a sort of community and uproar, um, imagine like the Vicar of Dibley. That's sort of what I was picturing in my head, like th those sorts of people. <laughs> um, and uh, while all that was going on, there was also this tension between Bilal and his wife and her ex-partner, the the father, um, the biological father of her child. And I think the reason I, I struggled a bit was because I didn't particularly like either Bilal or her, or maybe it's not that I didn't like them. I just, I didn't really feel like I, I fully knew them. I never felt like I really got under the skin of those characters. And so the bits of the book that were following like their relationship arc, I didn't kind of, get as much out of but on the whole I think it was like an uplifting feel-good book it had the quality of like a Shakespeare comedy towards the end with how rapidly she was like winding up all of the uh all of the loose threads but like I don't not enjoy that it was just yeah it was it was lovely and it, ha it is um it's a book that's set a lot around Christmas time so if you have a better memory than me pop this book on your like pre-Christmas reading because you'll have a lovely time with it. It was, yeah, it's not going to be a favourite book of mine, but it was, it was enjoyable. And the final book I read this month is Brutes by Diz Tate. And this book has forced me to confront something about myself that um, I think I've known for a long time because I should have enjoyed this book. This is a... Um, a sort of a literary crime book told from the perspective of a group of young girls in Florida um, and, and someone they know goes missing when they're young and they, you kind of know they know something about it and there's parts of the book that are told um, from this like choral plural voice of we when they were when they were younger like we do this we did this we went over here we observed that from the point when the crime or incident happens and then you get sections uh in the modern day where they're all kind of like i guess like in late 20s early 30s they're all being drawn back to um back to the site of it. It reminded me a lot of Carla by Colin Walsh and also a bit of Penance by Eliza Clark. Um, Carla I really liked, Penance I not so much, which was a shame because I love boy parts, but that's by the by. I think I should have liked this book, but I straight up couldn't follow it. I, d I don't know if this ever happens to you with... <laughs> I had this experience um, with a few audiobooks now where like, I'm listening to them and I miss something, but because of the way it's written, I can't work out when I missed the thing or even if I actually missed something or if the author is trying to wrong foot me. And so I'll assume, oh, they're just wrong footing me. And then later on I'll be like, oh no, I really have missed something. Uh, I, I need to go back and find the thing that I missed, but because I don't know the thing that I missed and I don't know when it could have happened, I just totally lost myself in this book in like not a good way. So I don't even feel like I can review it because I did read it, but I couldn't tell you what happened. I genuinely can't. I f and I don't know if I'm supposed to know and I fucked it up <laughs> or if, if it stays completely open I've got I've got no idea um but it has made me make some resolutions about my audiobook reading uh you will have noticed I, I really liked the non-fiction book that I read I love a memoir on non-fiction and I like a reread I also do quite well with a plot driven narrative driven crime book I have liked the Nikki French books on audio and I've completely been able to follow them I've liked TM Logan's books um, on audio before, but I officially am banning myself, at least in the short term, but possibly forever, from literary fiction on audio, particularly this kind of like multi-narrative thing.
thing because I, I don't think it is a format that works for me. I feel like I don't read the book properly when I listen to it on audio. And that's not because listening to an audio book isn't proper reading because of course it is, but I'm saying I don't read it properly <laughs> when I listen on audio. So I did read Brutes by Dizte. I don't know, man. But um, I think part of the problem, I think there's two problems with it. One is just that I should avoid literary fiction, but I also think I had a tendency to, and let me know if, if this is something that you've come across yourself before. If you've got like a library app where you get your audiobooks or like a subscription service like Everand or whatever, where you've basically got unlimited access. So you're not like buying a title. You're like, you can just access the library. I definitely am guilty of going, oh, I've heard of that book, I'll listen to it on audio, and not really thinking about whether that format is the right format for me to read that book, and just going, oh, but it's available on audio, so I'll just read it on audio. This is where my impatience needs to not come into play, <laughs> because I think there are some books that I just shouldn't read on audio. Um, and also, I, I definitely have been guilty of, I stick it, I don't like being alone in silence with my own thoughts. And sometimes I've spoken before on my Instagram stories when this was all kicking off um, about, I, I sometimes find listening to music stressful. It involves a lot of decision making that I don't always have the bandwidth for. And so an audiobook will often be the first thing I stick on to have as a noise in the background. Um, and that means I'm not often, I'll put it on, but I'm not often in a space where I can actually really give it the attention that it needs. So instead, I've rediscovered podcasts and I've been having a lovely time with podcasts. So I think you will be seeing fewer audiobooks from me in the future um, because I'm, I'm going to take a bit of a hiatus from them. I think I need to uh, unlearn some bad habits with audiobooks but I'm having a lovely time with the with podcasts so let me know if uh you would like me at any point on my channel to do a rundown of some of the podcasts because like um my followers on Instagram um which is always linked in the description box if you don't follow me there go because fun things like podcast chat happen over there um I got loads of recommendations from people and I've been slowly working my way through a number of them. So let me know if you would uh, like an update uh, in the future. And yeah, just uh, that has been my reading in January. On the whole, really positive. Haven't loved everything, but um, I've, I've liked so many of these books an awful lot. And I think the bar has been set so high for best books of the year. Like Maps of, Maps of Our Spectacular Bodies, Open Water, Poor Things they're going to be quite hard to beat. So I'm excited for the rest of 2024. Tell me how your reading month has been. How was your January? What was the best book you read in January? And um, yeah, if you've read any of these, let me know. And um, maybe if you've read Brutes and really liked it, maybe tell me if I should revisit that in a different format. I am going to have forgotten absolutely everything about the book that I ever read in two to three months time so I, I probably could revisit it um but yeah I'm gonna leave you there I've been talking for a very long time and my throat is quite dry and I need to go and walk my dog so that's been me and January and I will see you soon if you've enjoyed this video please do give it a little like and subscribe to my channel if you haven't done that and um yeah see you soon bye <laughs>